Welcome to Screenshots. Juan, what do we have for our viewers today? We're going to have um, the recap of the um, uh, Westerns. Uh, Western New, New England's. England's. New England's men's draw. And then uh, we're going to talk about the Midwesterns. And we're going to cover how to deal with a good return of serves. Um, we see uh, many club players don't adjust. And they um, have trouble trying different formations uh, on the serving. So we're going to do a tip with uh, Roxy. And uh, hopefully you will make some returns to to show uh, to show this drill properly. That's all I got. OK. Good. And, and we're also wel welcoming the second best Argentine commentator in the field to the show yeah, as a uh, correspondent. Yeah, Patricio is going to be doing a recap of the Western New England with you. OK, terrific. We'll be right back. So I am welcome to the show, Patricio Mizzetrano, our newest Thank you. Screenshots correspondent. Uh, Juan and I were out in Cincinnati, so we didn't get to see any of the long meadow tournaments, so we thought we'd bring Patricio in to give us a report in the tournament. So why don't we start with the quarters, Patricio? The, uh, I guess the most interesting quarter, or surprising maybe, was Michael Montalbano and DJ Getz versus Johan Durant and Jeff Morneau. Tell us a little bit about that match. Well, the score was 7-5 and 7-6, and DJ and Monty had to play the great match to play against those guys so, so close. I know they actually did play a really good match because afterwards, Jeff Morneau told me that it was a really close match, and not until the very end when they were able to, to win a few more points and then get the win. In uh, inimitable Monty fashion, I was sitting at lunch in Cincinnati with Juan and Max, and we got a text from Monty that said, my winning streak against Johan is over, referring to his one win at Shoreline last year. So let's go on to the next, uh, next quarterfinal. Um, Mike Stulak and Scott Kaler versus Mark Parsons and the mental giant Brian O'Connor. Did you get to see any of that? Yeah, I saw some of the points. I wasn't really following the score because I was on court, and when I came off the court, they were still playing. It looked a pretty close match. They were having great points. The score doesn't reflect, I guess, the, how close the match looked from outside, but maybe I just saw some of the points that Stulak and Kaler won. In the end, it was 6-3, 6-2. Didn't, didn't look so close, but from, from outside the court, it did, it did look pretty close. It's interesting when Parsons and O'Connor were making their rise to be one of the best teams, they had that one season where they were undefeated against everybody else and 0-6 against Mike Stulak. Yeah. Remember the shirts they used to wear? Yeah, I can beat. What was it? Was it I, slam ball, undefeated against it, everyone else, 0-6 against Stulak? Stulak. Yeah. Mark had, had the shirt. I don't think Mark has no? lost to Stulak since they... Yeah, well, then they played together. They played together for two years, and I don't think he's lost since they split up. Yeah. Okay, so that match was relatively quick. Um, Sebastian Bredberg and Martin Bostrom played against... Javi Fern Cranevitter and Andrea Bonafigli? Yeah, I was most of the time on the court while they were still playing. I saw some of the very few last points of the match. It was a close match again. I think a little bit of lack of experience from Javi and Andrea was probably the difference. Martin and Sebastian are a very experienced team and they were able to pull both of the sets. And, and I know they're a tough team and we were looking forward to play and that was our, our next next match after we came off the court so i tried to watch a little bit well javi javi's really playing well i think he's benefited greatly from playing with juan in the premier league and playing at a high level on a every other sunday night basis and i think that's really been, been be beneficial for his game yeah a, a couple of weeks ago i think he had and uh, two wins against the other two argentinians in the rankings in the same day when he won the connecticut state mixed he was coming off a easy win in the FCPTL in the morning against me. And I guess then he later on beat Juan. So he went 2 and 0 against Argentinians. Impressive. OK, so the last semi, last quarter was yours. A uh, rematch of a terrific match at Sound Shore, which you guys won in three sets. You and Anton Maverin against Mick Ardoya and Mark Innes. So tell us a little bit about that match. Well, I watched the review of the live streaming match. It was a very long match, and I watched it, and I actually um, picked up on a few things that we were doing wrong, I thought, and the commentary was pretty spot on. 
we changed our strategy and we kept the balls more on the same side without shifting so much and changing the direction of the ball on our overheads and, and it paid off. Then we were going on Mark's side with our overheads and they switched and then we went also on Mark's side, on the do side and every once in a while we would go on Mick's side and big drive would come on our side. We made a lot of volleys and it was four and, four and five. They picked up their level in the second set um, but I think keeping the balls on the same side and not shifting so much at the net, it, it was actually the right thing to do for us. Okay, so now we're up to the semis and the two semifinal matchups appear to be really juicy matchups. You guys versus Bredberg and Bostrom and then Parsons Duran on opposite sides of the court. So let's talk about that match first and let's not spend too much time on it because it wasn't a particularly long match, was it? No, it was not. So. What was the story you told me that when you went out, you went out a few minutes after the first semi and Rob Coster asked if you'd switch to the main court when they were done? Yeah, the, the main court, there was a camera, they were recording the, the match. They went maybe 20 minutes, 25 minutes before us and because we had a, a longer quarterfinals matches and we finished later than them. So when we are warming up, uh, Rob Coster comes over and says, do you guys mind moving to the show court when they finish, and I, we all said, no, no problem. We played one game, and then we ended up moving. Parsons didn't want to give up the court. He said he was comfortable there, he wanted to watch from there, but it was a really short match. Two in love? Two in love, the ball was moving really fast, the points were really short, and apparently Johan and Jeff won most of them. Well, the mental giant could not have played too well, and I kind of picked the mental giant, so. That's the last time I'm going to make that mistake. So now let's talk about your semi with Boston Bredberg. You guys had a terrific match with them last year at Short Hills. Long three setters, six, four, seven, five in the third. Yeah. Hadn't quite gotten over the hump against them. What was the difference on Saturday? Um, I think the conditions played a, a big role. It was really cold, probably about 10 degrees when we played them. It got a little colder towards the end of the day. We knew that. and that was going to play a big factor and we actually used the right strategy this time too. We tried to keep the balls more on Sebastian's side and then switch over to Martin every once in a while, trying not to give him too much rhythm. And Martin told me yesterday that actually that worked <laughs> against them. And Sebi had a tough time um, to get used to the balls. We, also, we all had a tough time because the ball was really, really hard. It was hard to love off the deck, it was hard to volley unless you actually hit the ball a little bit harder. And we played solid. We made all our volleys. We didn't shift as much as the net. And we picked our spots from the backcourt. OK, so that puts you in the finals against <laughs> Johan and Morneau. And that's a lot of paddle in one day, especially if you're not in terrific shape. And I know you're in terrific shape, but your partner maybe not quite so much? Well, I'm training for the New York Half Marathon and running for MMRF and raising funds for them. So I've been running and, and getting ready. I'm improving my fitness. I lost some weight. How would people donate to that, Patricio? They can go on the MMRF site and then type in my name. And actually, there's a few clicks that you have to go in there before that. But if you go on my Facebook page, and then you can, you can probably find the, the link to donate money. OK, so you're in the finals. You're in good shape. Your partner a little bit less so. Is Anton tired coming into the match? Because you would played a bunch of matches beforehand. He was tired going into the first warm-up in the first match. He told me when he gets really tired, he channels his inner Bondo yeah. and plays like Scott Bondurant. He plays like Scott Bondurant and makes the same grunts when he drives. And he moves a little slower than Bondo, actually, now. But and Anton pulled, pulled through. He knew he was tired. And I knew he was tired, so I tried to cover a little bit of some of the short balls or the hard overheads against his back and wire. I covered some of the shots that he normally would get. And I played on my side, I hit my shots. He was solid off the, off the baseline. He made a lot of volleys. We hit good overheads. We kept the balls away from Johan as much as possible. And then we hit a few behind him. And to keep him honest, we made a lot of volleys. I think I hit. My volleys were, was, were, were pretty good on, on Saturday. I think maybe it was the best day I've ever volleyed. And so we kept the, the match close, uh, except for the first couple of games that we played horrible. I think we made 16 and four errors. So you lost the first games. set 6-4? We lost 6-4. 
Then we won 6-2. We um, tightened up um, a couple of things. What specifically we, did you tighten up to turn things around so dramatically? And we missed a lot of balls off the, off the deck and off the wire easy shots because it was hard to... I had a tough time getting used to the ball being so hard. And at the net, we actually played really well and we drove the ball well. It was easy, easy shots off the wire and off the deck on the backcourt that we missed a ton. Okay, so we're set a piece going to the final set. You guys must have been feeling pretty confident going to yeah. the third. Tell me how that unfolded. And it was a close third set, and we were trying again, keeping the ball on Jeff's side. He drove the ball really well. He did not make many errors. Johan made more errors than Jeff. I think we were up 5-4. Um, Who Anton, was serving? Anton was serving. We got to advantage in. And then match point. Match point for us. There was a drive a little bit high that was going in. Anton tried to get it in and then missed it on top of the net. And in the end, they came back and then they won 7 5. Well, a great performance and a great result for you guys. I don't know how it's going to impact the rankings very much because you had a pretty good result there last year and it was a much higher rated tournament. Yeah, we're going to pick up a few points. But in the end, I told Anton, yes, I'm upset. I'm going to tell everyone you missed the match point. But we, we really I, are. And now you get to tell everyone who's watching screenshots. Everyone here. But in the end, I, I said to him, look, you know, we played three really tough matches, and that was one of the things that we struggled with to have one good match and then not so good the next one, or play really solid against really good teams throughout the entire match. And I thought we did in three matches in a row. So we're going to pick at nationals, and that's, that's the goal. We, we really, you know, it would have been nice to win. But in the end, it's just one, one point that it doesn't really matter that much when you're trying to do well in nationals. Well, it's got to give you a lot of confidence. I mean, if, Ant, if, if Johan and Jeff Morneau played an entire season together, I imagine they'd be top five in the country. Of course, Johan might be top five in the country with my grandmother, and she's dead. So, <laughs> But Jeff's slightly better than my dead grandmother. So I would assume that would be the case. That's got to give you a lot of confidence you're playing at level because Sebastian and Martin are a top 10 team. Mick and Mark Innes, real good squad. Yeah. You guys have to have played real well. Yeah, we did. We're playing well. We had a good um, win in the Premier League and before the tournament. And other than, you know, like I said, other than the fact that we have not been able to play back to back to back well and solid against the top teams, this was the, the difference in, in this tournament, that we were able to do that. And what's the next tournament for you guys? And we're playing Boston and on the 24th. Then we're going over to Philly and uh, Nationals. Okay, it's going to be good to see you at Nationals last year. I know you missed Nationals due to the birth of your, your daughter, so it will be good to have you back at Nationals this yeah, year. Yeah, it will be good to, to be back at Nationals. I watch from, from home. Okay, well, thank you for joining us, and thank you're you welcome. for that comprehensive update on Longmeadow. We'll look forward to yeah, seeing you again later welcome. in the season, Pleasure. Patricio. So Juan, last weekend was the Midwesterns, which you have some passing degree of familiarity with. Yeah. Let's start off with a couple of upsets in the round of 16. Yeah. So the DC guys, who were really starting to make a mark on the circuit. So Tommy Croker, who had a terrific tournament at Sound Shore, played this weekend with Trevor Spracklin. And they played against Mike Cochran and Scott Estes, who were finalists the year before. Did you see any of that match? We saw a little bit, we're watching because we were waiting for our round of 16 match. We were inside the hut with Max, and um, it was a fun match. I mean, a lot of uh, good points, fast pace. Um, I really like the way Trevor Spragling plays. I mean, I Me think too. he is so talented. Um, uh, I, I think his weakness is the lack of patience sometimes. I mean, he's a, he seems to be, I've never seen him play tennis, but he seems to have all the shots. And then he wants to end the point sometimes a little too soon. I remember playing him. He played with um, Juan Jason, the number one Indian player um, at Lehigh. And I played with Gillespie. Um, we lost the first set 6-3 against them. And then I, the next thing I told Gillespie was, Mike, the only thing I want you to drive from now on is your car back to Connecticut. <laughs> and uh, from then on, he started loving every ball. And uh, those two guys uh, got uh, impatient. And we actually ended winning 0-0. Wow. Um, and this weekend against Mike and Scott, they played the pace that they wanted to play at. And I think that was the difference. Um, 
even though they lost the second set six love and then they were able to come back and, and win the third set. Uh, I think it was a well played match and uh, it's a good matchup for them. Trevor is a little more polished than Tommy. Yes. He's got the roller overhead. Tommy's still hitting the overheads a little too flat. But Tommy's now beaten top 10 teams the last two major tournaments yes. with two different partners, yeah. and they're coming fast. Yeah. So the other, I guess you'd have to call it an upset in the round of 16, was, uh, was the match between Peter Burka and the future Jerani Barnes against Alex Benchila and Chris Gambino. Yeah. And that was a bit of a beatdown. It was 3-1? Three 3-1. and one. Three and one. Um, Yeah, for, for I was Burka, expecting... Burka Barnes. Yes. I was expecting that match to be actually very long because all those guys know each other very well. Um, I was surprised also by the score. And I even said it in the preview. Um, I much rather... Uh, uh, I, I actually like the, the style from Banchila and Gamino better than Berka and Barnes. Much but, faster pace. But Berka and Barnes are m a lot more effective. And um, I didn't get to watch much because I was playing. I watched a little bit of the first set. They were having good games, but then all of a sudden, Max told me that Burke and Barnes won a lot of games in a row, and Peter was the better player, the best player on the court at, at one point. Then uh, for the second set, we were already on the court, so I didn't get to watch that. But uh, I heard a lot of uh, screaming and uh, unhappiness from uh, uh, the court right next to us. Yeah. Okay, so that takes us into the quarters. First quarter was you guys versus. Spracklin and Croker. Yeah. yeah. You guys played a really solid match, which is going to end up being the theme of the show. But you really just didn't give them much chance to breathe. Yeah. Um, we, I knew that Trevor didn't like playing the slow pace. So uh, we talked with Max before the match, and we said that that's what we had to do. We had to slow them down, pick our spots, wait for the right ball to drive, because those guys start getting impatient. They start hitting the ball a little harder, and then they give us a lot of chances to drive the ball off the wires. And I think we lobbed very well. We moved the ball around very well. We caught them off balance a few times. Um, so uh, I think that was the difference. I mean, those guys are really good Rockets players. I think we volleyed very well as well. Uh, but that was the difference. The, the lobbing game, the backcourt game was the biggest difference in that match. Um, okay, next quarter was the uh, good, speed Bacher, good Speed and Rob Bacher versus Burke and Barnes. And that was a rematch of a terrific match in Chicago that we talked about that went three and a half hours. This one wasn't three and a half hours, but it was pretty long. It was two and a half and finished with the same score, 7-5 in the third. 7-5 in the third again. Um, those teams seem to they match up well against each other. Um, we all know Scott can play. I mean, sorry, Flip can, can play uh, uh, at this high level still, I and mean, he's amazing. I sent him a text after the tournament telling him that he was he's a role model to all of us and he inspired all of us to 53 years old. He's amazing. He's just amazing. Um, and he managed to pull that win. I mean, I, I think Rob also must have played great uh, because, you know, Flip cannot win on his own. Yeah, but was that the Camargo Club where Rob is the host pro? There was a lot of support for him, a lot of cheering when they won points. Um, so I didn't get to watch much, but it looked like a, like a war. Well, those guys are now pretty much guaranteed a top four seed at Nationals, and I have to say, right. with that semi, to go with the semi at Nationals and the semi at Charities. So those coveted top seeds at Nationals are starting to fill up. So next match was uh, Baxter and Heath versus Nathan Lefevre in from California and Anthony Cosimano. Going into the match, I really made Anthony and Nathan pretty good favorites. I really felt like they would control the pace of play, but that's not what happened. I think that uh, I like those two guys a lot, Anthony and Nathan, they're good friends. I think that um, they're not, for some reason, they're not playing well together. I think there is a lot of miscommunication. I think Nathan is going for a little too much sometimes. Uh, I saw a few points, and he was trying to put the ball away sometimes. Uh, he's little by little losing his patience, and maybe that's the lack of play at the high level. Um, it's interesting because last year, his first year at Lagunitas, he played very well. Made a semi at Boston. They were a top, I guess they were seated sixth or seventh coming to nationals and were a real factor through the course of the year. This year they've struggled. They lost early in Chicago, did finish fifth there, but didn't play real well and then really played, I thought, well, they lost, they lost in the quarters also 
at uh, no sorry in the round of 16 at Soundshore to Croker and Hume yep now they have this loss I, I even said it in the preview that I haven't seen them play well together I hope they start playing better uh, because they're good players but on the other hand I mean we gotta give them the credit to uh, Baxter and Heath Baxter and Heath I mean they very they athletic well, team very athletic I think that uh, their positioning on the court is still not uh, perfect but that's something they can get better at if they keep playing um, but um, I think um, they're, they're getting better they're getting better and they, they, they have all the shots okay we'll talk about them a little more as we go on okay, okay so next quarter last quarter was George Wilkinson and Marco Grangero versus Mike Marino and Dane Schmigdal you get to see any of that? I got to watch yeah. the third set. Yeah, we watched a little bit. Um, Marino and Schmigo won the first set. Um, and then uh, I saw the end of the second set uh, where George and Marco looked very relaxed. They started to play better, um, picking their spots. And uh, for some reason, Mike Marino started hitting these FYMs and giving up the net constantly. He must which, have hit 15 of them in the third set. Yeah, which to me, in that cold weather, giving up the net is, you ain't paying for it. Um, I don't know if he was tired and he couldn't hit more overheads. He didn't have the stamina maybe left, but I think that was the difference maker in that match. I mean, he started hitting too many of those and those guys were just letting them hit it and then taking the net and waiting for uh, Mike's and Dane's mistake. Yeah, the third set started off competitively, and then George and Marco won, I think, four or five games in a row to get up to a 5-1 lead, and then really struggled to close it out. I think it took seven or eight match points, yeah. and Marino and Schmigdal are terrific competitors. And George looked, George played well. I thought Marco was a little bit uncomfortable in the third set, and we'd see a lot more of that the next day. So that brings us to the semis on Sunday. So let's start off with that match. George and Marco versus Baxter and Heath. In a match, I thought that George and Marco were gonna win pretty comfortably won the first set easily, and then Baxter and Heath went into a bit of a shell and won the second set easily. So the first two sets go relatively quickly, 6-2, six, 6-1, six, about the same time speed that your semi was going on at the next match. Third set, George and Marco win the first two games, and then Marco, got, again, got very uncomfortable and started playing way too fast from my perspective. Not just Marco, I think that George, too. I, was watching, I wasn't there, but I watched online while uh, the French was taking his yearly shower. Um, I thought it was semi-annual. No, no, it's once a year. Once don't. a year, okay. Yeah. So, um, so he was taking a shower at Camargo, and I was watching online. And um, the first two games, uh, I thought, okay, that's it, it's over. But then they started making too many mistakes. I think they probably saw the finish line and they wanted to end the match quickly, and they ended paying for it. I mean, George also started hitting too many hard overheads to. Uh, to Ricky Heath, to Ricky. he hit that hard overhead into the backside wire, and, and Ricky's they, hitting the backhand from the service line. Yeah. So. I don't know. I don't know what happened. Uh, they just looked uncomfortable to me on the court. Yeah, it's, they started making some silly mistakes. Uh, they started pressing and they paid for it. Okay, so the other semifinal is you and Max versus the number one seeds, the number three team of the country, the hometown heroes, Rob Bacher and Flip Goodspeed. And I was fortunate enough to call the match and it was one of the Best exhibition to paddle I've seen in a long time. You guys were absolutely brilliant. Yeah, we play very well. Did you get a chance to watch the match again? I did watch it online, and I was I still couldn't believe it when I watched it online. And you looked as comfortable in that match to me as I've seen you on the court since Leonard left. Yeah, I agree. I felt like there was no ball my partner couldn't get to. And um, he made me f play very free, and picking my spots, taking my shots. Uh, I knew that if I even hit a bad lob, uh, Max was going to get to the ball anyways. Uh, I wasn't afraid of him making mistakes. So how did you, where, where did that comfort level come from? Because it clearly wasn't an evidence in Chicago. Max struggled in Chicago. You weren't comfortable with him in Chicago. Well, the, 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 comfortable, the comfortable level came because uh, I knew Max couldn't be any worse than what he played <laughs> in Chicago. No. Uh, Max, I mean, with Max not playing his best, we managed to get to the semis in Chicago. And um, we, did, we had a great tournament. We had uh, some wins. We even played well against uh, Duran and Parsons. I mean, other things happened. I was a little injured. I mean, they were... Uh, Probably, you, know, you played a good, good, solid we match played against match. those guys. I mean, 
They just played better. And they, they play much better. I think they actually play very well that match. Um, but um, I don't know. Um, this time, Max was hitting his forehand. He's loving well, hitting some, uh, dinking some balls to the, our opponent's feet when they were off the net. And uh, we were moving the ball around well. Uh, we talked about the strategy, um, letting me play a little more the, the balls in the middle. Um, I think we communicated great. We, we played very well. So any, uh, any, anything specific that gave you such a comfort level with them? I don't know. I mean, I think the, the fact that uh, we spent uh, the, the night together at the hotel and the, the two of you were watching the, the, the football game. Uh, in bed together. In bed together. That kind of made me relax and uh, made me think about other things instead of worrying too much about. We'll, we'll get away from that quickly for Max's benefit. <laughs> But you know, one of the things that I thought. By you the guys way, I have a picture to prove it. <laughs> one of the things that I thought you guys did exceptionally well was you really. We talk a lot about Johan expanding the backcourt when he's at the net, and I think that you guys did an exceptional job of expanding the net when you were in the backcourt. Max had a lot of chips, which caused them to have to move in, and then you guys lobbed so well. I mean, I think Brian Heil, my my partner, commentating the match, at one point counted ten consecutive overheads that were hit by, the, by one partner or the other that were switching back and forth, which is a testimony to how well you were lobbing. Yeah, yeah. I, I, one thing that uh, I even tell you when we play together, that I want you when I lob down the line to try to take some of those balls that are hit to your side wire. And I was telling Max the same thing, and Max did that very well. He made our opponents pay a lot of times with that, when that ball is hit to the black hole, and he was driving the forehand behind them. Um, so when I was lobbing down the line, he was moving, so, you know, I, I felt like he uh, could hurt our opponents a lot from the backcourt, and that helped me not to press because I could wait for the right ball uh, when he was coming to me, and uh, Max was hitting the right shots when they were going to him. So uh, we played very steady. I, I think we made very, very few unforced errors. So lots of times it's really hard to back up a near perfect match, which you played against Goodspeed and Bakker, with another one in the finals. So you guys go out to play Baxter Heath. You have to wonder whether they were happy to get to the finals. Big result for them, just making the finals. And you just jumped all over them. I think you won the first five games in, in maybe 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, to be honest, I think that in that match, we knew that if we play the same way that we played in the match before, there was no doubt we were going to win. And uh, we tried to play at the same pace. We controlled the tempo. And uh, those guys are hard hitters. They're you know, you can tell that they they like the fast pace, so we tried to slow it down, and they made some um, mistakes. Uh, they were a little impatient. And well, it was interesting. Was, Ryan played a little impatiently. Ricky played overly patiently, I thought. I didn't understand his... Yeah, but at the net, they were both... At the net, yes. Yeah, but impatient. in the backcourt, Ricky standing in the backcourt three feet behind the baseline with yeah, Continental Yeah, and I grip. think they were giving me too much, the side wire, for me to spin the ball there and even when I was in trouble with a deep lob I could still access the side wire and you know and wait for the short lob to create some offense. Well I know you guys impressed at least one person this weekend because I got a text from Flip after the match mm -hmm. suggesting that you were juicing. <laughs> so are there any PEDs that you would recommend to our viewers that will help your game? <laughs> no just spend a lot of time on the treadmill. Okay, well, congratulations on your Thanks. big win at Cincy, and uh, we look forward to seeing you and Max on the court again in the future. Thanks, and congratulations to you for winning the 90s, too. Well, I just covered two boards, so yeah. I only get like a like tenth of the well, trophy. Well, and that was one too many. Okay, that finishes our Cincy wrap-up. Chester Country Club with the director of Pile at the club, Roxy Enica. And uh, we're going to show different formations on how to play against the good returns. Um, the regular formation, what we call the regular formation, is the net player uh, of the serving team being on the same side to where the server is going to hit the ball to. So if I'm serving to the do side, this will be the regular formation. So when I serve, I'm coming in this way, and now I'm making the volley. But if I struggle with making that volley, I'm going to try a different formation. And we have um, a couple of uh, variations of this. So we have the, the I formation first. The I formation's Roxy is going to be standing on the center line. 
So by doing this, we're taking away the cross court return from the player. And I'm going to search to the two side again. But I'm going to be coming in to the, to the spot where she was originally on the regular formation. By doing this, we take the cross court return because if now the returns come to the same spot where the player was returning to, go see, stay low, stay there. If the player returns cross court, now she's right there to make the volley. So we're just giving a different look to our to the returner and the, by changing the direction of the ball and the, by taking away the high percentage shot, which is a cross court since the net is a little lower in the middle. One important thing about the eye formation is that we would like to serve down the middle to take the angle away. If I happen to serve wide too much, that player will have access always to the down the line shot and for me to make this ball is going to be a lot harder. Another formation or a variation of the eye formation would be the server staying back. So if Roxy is standing here, can I have a ball please? So if Roxy is standing here and I still struggle to make that first volley when they return down the line, I'm going to stay back. So what we're going to do is this. I'm going to serve the ball. I'm moving here. The return comes. Roxy is coming back. I love it. And now we're in position and we're starting to play the point. So by doing this, we're just not losing the point on the first ball and we're giving ourselves a chance to get in the point. Another formation that we can we can use, and this is, I, I really want to encourage players to start using this when you're getting beat with the returns. It's not the end of the world to give up the net. We much rather give up the net than lose the point. You can win a lot of points from the backcourt as well. So what we're going to do with Roxy is, Roxy, is, when she plays with me, she's usually the deuce core player. I play the add. So she's going to continue to play on the deuce even though I'm serving to the deuce. So I'm going to have Roxy play on the two side here. And I'm going to serve cross court. And we're just giving the net away now. We're going to let the, our opponents return the ball and come to the net. We're not even going to try to make this volley. And the way I could, I could easily serve like this. And then I will move to my position. I can serve like this. They return. And now we start playing the point. I know that it's not pretty. And that will be the last thing we try. But. It's effective and might give us a chance to start playing a lot of points if we're getting beat with a return. All right, Roxy, thank you for helping with the tip. Do you have any other things that you'd like to add? Uh, yes, I would like to add just one thing, and um, it's a little bit different than tennis. Um, you have the beauty in this sport to, if you're having a hard time with the return, you can always let the ball go and play it off the screen and just try to stay in the point. That's a great strategy, and um, I think everybody should uh, adopt this strategy if you're having troubles with the uh, with the return. Well, thank you. Thanks for your help. Thank you. And congrats on your new job at Westchester Country yeah. Club. Thank you. I need it. <laughs>